Bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June edition of the ASP.NET Blazor Community Standup. Uh, my name is McKinnon Buck. I'm a developer on the ASP.NET team. I managed to mute myself, but I think we're there. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, nice. great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, today, we have John Galloway. Um, Hello. <laughs> and we have a very special guest, uh, Hunter Freeman. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, the topic of today's uh, stream is we are going to be showing Hunter's project, which is um, Blazor Studio, or sh should we be calling it Blazor Studio, or does it have a new name now? <laughs> um, uh, so in order to take the Blazor namespace out of uh, the mix, I created another repo, which is taking over, and its name is luthitus.ide. So that way it doesn't have Blazor in the name. Got it. OK, so Luthitus. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, today we're going to uh, have Hunter show us uh, this project and talk about some of the implementation details as well. And uh, but yeah, so before we jump into that though, we're going to go over some community links. Um, and so let's go ahead and share my screen if possible. Um, yeah. So this is just a chance for us to you know give shout outs to interesting community projects um, involving Blazor. So first on the list we have codebeam.mudblazor.extensions. So this is a library that extends Mudblazor with additional components that Mudblazor doesn't have out of the box. So it's really cool. It has a ton of added components if you need something um, maybe a little bit more niche that Mudblazor doesn't come with. And they have a cool demo website too that allows you to play around with these components. Uh, they have some really you know kind of cool ones like you know, custom scroll bars, uh, like wheel pickers and things like that. Uh, so if you want some of these, you know, kind of more interesting components in your project and you're already using Mudblazor, um, you know, definitely give this uh, uh, package a look. All right, next we have a, um, a Visual Studio extension called Blasm Extension, and this is by Jimmy Engstrom. And this is, this just provides like a lot of nice, um, like helper features for Blazor developers. So uh, for example, there's like a right-click menu for creating an isolated CSS file or an isolated JavaScript file or a code behind file um, when you right-click on a, a Razor component. Uh, and then there are also some other kind of nice refactoring features like moving a code behind file to a Razor, uh, to a Razor file and things like that. Um, and then also some, you know, a shortcut for switching between the code behind file and a Razor file, which I find myself doing a lot. So I think that would be super helpful. Um, so yeah, if you want like an extra productivity boost, definitely check out this Visual Studio extension. All right, next we have a another library by Christopher Strube. So this is Blazor.webaudio, which provides like a .NET wrapper around the Web Audio browser API. Um, Christopher has made lots of these uh, types of libraries where um, where you can access like browser features without having to do JavaScript interop. Um, and this is this is another one to add that add to that list. So um, it's I just think it's so cool because there's more and more every day it feels like that you can do using .NET without having to you know dive into JavaScript. Uh, and there's like a cool demo website too. Uh, I'll probably turn on the volume in case uh, you know in case it's too loud. But um, but yeah, you can do really crazy things like. Um, yeah, by by accessing like these native um, like browser APIs, and um, you know, yeah. So if you're like building maybe a uh, some sort of audio synthesizer that needs to run to run the web or something like that, maybe this library would be useful for you. So yeah. Next we have um, a YouTube video uh, by the Coding After Work YouTube channel called "Running Blazor in Production: Lessons Learned," and. Maybe that sounds like a daunting title, like, oh, should we not use Blazor in production? But no, the, the point of the video, the video is actually like Blazor is great for building production quality applications. And there's lots of really good advice in this video uh, about how to be successful doing that. So um, so yeah, if you if you are working on a Blazor app that you want to you know productize, give this video a watch because it has lots of interesting um, tidbits of information that could probably be useful to you. And lastly, we have a fun one. Um, this is Bertle, and it's a clone of Wordle, but um, but written in Blazor WebAssembly. I, I saw this initially from a 
uh, Reddit post on the Blazor subreddit. Um, and I would link that, but Reddit's kind of undergoing a um, strike kind of right now. So a lot of subreddits have gone private. So I, that post would have more information, but it, but we just can't see the post right now. But we have the mm -hmm. app right here. Um, it's basically Wordle. So um, it's, but it's written in Blazor. So I, I don't know. I, I just thought it was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to play out the whole game, but yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, or I could, I don't know. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it for the community link. So I think we can transition into the main part of the stream. Um, and, uh, so yeah, Hunter, if you want to take it away. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, uh, my name is Hunter Freeman and, uh, how do I get my, uh, screen to be shared? There it is. There it is. <laughs> so. I'm going to uh, just run Blazor Studio uh, or uh, IDE. I have it down on my taskbar. I'm not sure if the, the stream shows my taskbar or not, uh, but I've got just a link. I click on it. It opens up like that. Uh, the first thing that I'll do here is just make a new solution. So file new .NET solution. I'll name it Blazor CRUD app. And what I would want to do here is just traverse to the directory that I want to put this SLN in. So I could click up at the top here, and then this becomes an input uh, element so that I can type repos and hit enter, and then it takes me there. Uh, and this thing moves around and whatever. Uh, so I can then pick that I want to put inside of my demos directory this new SLN. So I hit select, it populates the directory uh, input element, and then I hit run. Uh, this then created the solution. And now we can see in the solution explorer over on the left, uh, that tree view node for the SLN. So I can then go further and create a new C sharp project. So I'll make laser crud app dot server side the template for this would be blazor server the parent directory uh, i can go into demos and i now see my blazor product directory was made so i select it by clicking on it and then it shows you what you're gonna uh, have your path set to down at the bottom of the input file dialog i hit select populates the uh, input element and I get a little preview here of what the command is that's going to be ran. I hit run. And there we go. I have my C Sharp project. I can double click on it. And then I get a text editor that showcases the content. And the other thing that you could do is you could uh, move these things into a solution folder, add project references, things of that nature. So for example, if I click on move to solution folder, I could say hosts, hit enter, and then there we go, it's in the solution folder. Uh, you could also say apple slash banana, and now it's going to be two solution folders deep. And there we go, apple, banana, here's a CS proj. And wow. In the bottom right, you can see these notifications. Uh, when you click on one of the buttons, it makes it a dialogue. Well, in the bottom right, you'll see that because I uh, am interacting with the terminal, sometimes I might end up modifying the contents of this csproj file itself. So for example, I could add a NuGet package. And then you'll see what I'm talking about, where it's going to prompt me to reload the CS proj because its contents have changed. So I go to dependencies, I expand it, I see my NuGet packages, my project references. Well, there's no NuGet packages right now. So let me go ahead and pull up this bottom view. And at the very, very bottom in the bottom left, there's a uh, tab that you can click for either terminal 
or nougat so i go to nougat i can select a project that i want to modify the solution folders seem to be showing as projects uh however i pick my uh project and perhaps i want to add microsoft dot extensions dot dependency injection uh, i'll just put a capital d i click submit and there we go uh, we have some output from this website here, the Azure Search USNC, uh, and it shows you all the versions that you can pick. Uh, you can change that. And then there's the button to actually add that. So I'll click add. And in the bottom right, we'll see the notification. Here it is right here. And then I can click this to make it a dialogue, uh, just as it was added to the project, that Nougat package. And as I was saying earlier, the terminal command just modified the contents of this csproj. So if I double click on the csproj tree view node, I will get notified in the bottom right that the contents have changed. So I'll do that right now. Double click, the file contents have changed. And I'm going to put these side by side. Uh, immediately when I click reload, you're going to see the text editor update. So I'll click reload right now. And there we go. We now have a uh, Nuka package involved here. So you can see that it's also version 7, which is the one that I chose. Uh, furthermore, uh, I can go back to the tree view look at my dependencies, my NuGet packages. I can expand this tree view node and it parses the XML file and pulls out all of the NuGet package references. So we see here, Microsoft.extensions.dependencyinjection.abstractions version seven. And that's exactly what we have here. So uh, this also gets done for the project references. Uh, if you were to have a project reference. And one of the things that is in this application is a fair bit of drag and drop. Uh, it's not entirely mobile friendly, but the idea is for this to be run on your operating system on like your desktop. Uh, so for example, the solution explorer, uh, I have it in the left most pane and I can click on it and then drag. And then you see, I get this uh, little amazing. drag thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can uh, let go on one of these drop zones. And then you see the solution folder is now on the right. And it maintained my state because one of the things that I find very useful when working with Blazor is dependency injection and decoupling my state from the component to instead uh, somewhere else that can live for a longer life cycle than the UI. Otherwise, once your component is no longer rendered, you lose your state. So by using dependency injection, I can get the state of the solution explorer uh, regardless of where I'm rendering it and regardless of whether it's currently rendered because the state is decoupled and dependency injected. So I could even put this solution explorer at the bottom. Uh, seemingly, I have two solution explorers. Uh, <laughs> but I can put this at the bottom. And then just like I said, uh, all the state is maintained. And there you go. Uh, so I'm going to put the solution explorer back on the left. Do that right now. And move this. All right, there we go. We're back uh, to business here. And I find it very useful. So I have a quick question. Um, is this, yeah. so I'm guessing this is using Blazor Hybrid. Is, is, is that correct? Because it's running on your desktop or? Uh, th th this is specifically is using Fotino.blazor. Uh, it's okay. I suppose a web view uh, of sorts. 
and uh i suppose that's all I, that i can say on it um but yeah yeah, yeah that makes sense cool yeah fotino.blazer uh, nice and one of the useful things when writing your code is for when you make a new c sharp file you want the namespace to be auto generated to be based off the folder structure from the CS proj, and you want to interpolate the file name as the class name, things like that. So for example, I can uh, hit the context menu button and that makes the context menu show up directly below the tree view node, or you could right click and then it shows up where you right click. Uh, but I'll hit the context menu button. Uh, also shift F10 uh, is supposed to work, but it didn't. That, that, that's like a accessibility thing where shift F10 is usually equivalent to context menu. Uh, so I'm making a new directory here and I'll call this person case. And then I expand this person case thing and then I can make a new templated file. Well, what about person model? Dot CS. The new templated file uh, component not uh, notices that you have a dot CS on the end. So because of that, it's going to do all of the generation for you of this class. So I hit enter and then here's my person model. I open it and we see that the namespace was based off the folder structure from the CS proj and the file name was interpolated as the class name. Uh, additionally, I'm working on a C sharp parser. It's super uh, scuffed because I'm writing it from scratch. And I think it's only been like a week of me working on it. Uh, but if I hover over person model, you can see it knows that it's a type symbol. And furthermore, perhaps I can make an interface and implement that interface and then go to definition. So let's see that. Uh, so I right click on the person case, new templated file, I person model dot CS. This is gonna be my uh, interface. I spelled model wrong. Let me just rename this real quick. All right. Oh, and this is an interface. So I save out that file there. I double click so that I select uh, the word. And then you could uh, use Control C to copy this. So you could also right click and copy. Mm -hmm. So I go to the person model. I add the inheritance uh, icon, uh, simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I put my interface that I want to implement. So save this file. It's currently saying that it's an undefined type or namespace. Um, I'll just hit F12 anyway and see what happens. Uh, I'm going to hit it right now. It didn't like it. Uh, I guess you win some, you lose some, but. Uh, <laughs> it's a demo, you know? Yeah. <laughs> of course um, it's going to happen. Was that one public? Yeah, it was. OK. Hmm. Yeah. I might. No, no big deal. I was control Z and control Y. That's why it jumped around so much. I was control Z and something. Mm -hmm. So uh, would it be the case then that my uh, new templated file does something for Blazor components? Because it's nice if it generated that code behind for me, uh, if I were to want that. So I can make a new templated file again. And this one I'll name person display dot razor. Well, it's used the dot razor extension. It gives me a checkbox asking if I want a razor code behind. I could turn it off or on. I'll keep it on. I hit enter. And then here we go. We have a uh, razor file generated. And we also have this fake nesting of the code behind. Uh, on the file system, these aren't nested. Uh, is what I'm referring to. 
Uh, and it generated also the code behind with the class name, component base being inherited, and the using for uh, Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Components uh, is there as well. And one of the things that I find interesting uh, in this application is, let me get a larger file here. There we go. So if I click on the settings uh, dialog here, I can change the theme of the application separately from the theme of the text editor. Um, so warning for five seconds or so, I'm gonna put on light theme. Here we go. And then you see the entirety of the app changes to light theme, but the text editor didn't change. Nice. Uh, and then I could change the text editor itself, put that to light theme. Uh, and now I'll go back to the dark theme. Uh, one of the content interesting warning, right? <laughs> <What was that? laughs> content warning warning on the theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to increase your font size, uh, I think it's really interesting to look at what happens when you just hold down the up arrow because how many state is changed or happening there, how much is rendering. Uh, it sounds quite intense. Uh, so it's always a fun thing for me to just hold down the up arrow for the font size. So look at the, te the text editor on the right here. I hold up the up arrow and I wow. feel like it's pretty smooth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was That's not impressive. this smooth until like uh, I was gonna come on here and then I, I spent like an entire day uh, <laughs> ago working on it. And let, let me ask, what sort of things did you do while you were working on it to make it smooth? I added a throttle. So mm. to me, the definition of throttle is specifically you handle the first event, start a timer, and then yeah. take the most recent event after the timer finishes, handle that, but throw away the rest. Um, so I've got my iThrottle class. Uh, I can bring that up real quick, actually. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I can show you some of the things, uh, the source code. Even yeah, that. yeah, that's fine. Uh, let's see. Here we are I've, while you're doing that. I've heard that called debouncing, also. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I find that debouncing, uh, to my definition, would be specifically relating to an event ceasing to fire, uh, mm -hmm. whereas it was firing in succession once it finally stops firing. That's the debounce. Then Got you it. handle that event. Uh, that's how I differentiate. You're, you're, just, you're throttling the events. You're handling some of them, but not every single. Or, uh, or you're, yeah. slow, you're using a timer to delay it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in my uh, solution explorer, I'll collapse everything real quick. Uh, I have my website, which is hosted up on GitHub. Uh, as just a static WASM app. And I have this folder for my libraries, which are separate uh, GitHub repos of mine. All of this is public on my GitHub. And in luthitus.common, I have my throttle that I was using. So I've got this folder named reactive. And if you want a uh, library for this, you could use reactive extensions, uh, that would that would be a library that you could use. But I wrote my own, I guess, bespoke uh, version of it. And for me, my throttle, as I had said, you want to handle that first event. Uh, so for example, let me bring up some usages of this throttle so that you can see what it looks like. So for example, the drag initializer, the, the, that drag and drop that I kept doing there, uh, I added this throttling logic to where I wrap the logic that had been there inside of this funk of task that gets passed into my fire async. 
I'm just wrapping the the original logic. I did this like two days ago, I believe. Um, it used to be just this part right here, but I wrapped it in the throttle, and then if we look at the throttle uh, constructor. You can choose what you want that time span to be. So we see here, I have my private I throttle field. I'm setting it to a new throttle. And the constructor for throttle is taking in a time span. Uh, I have this static property on my interface for I throttle named default throttle time span. Uh, I just wanted to change the throttle around throughout the entirety of the app all at once. So I'm grabbing here time span from milliseconds, 15. So here I'm throttling on 15 milliseconds. I wanted to do, uh, I saw somebody doing environment.tick ticks or something, dot tick. Um, and this comes out to be like 15 milliseconds on, on average. Uh, so that's why I just put 15 in line there because it wasn't really working for me. Uh, but one of the things that I think about is you, you don't want to throw too quickly because then you're adding all this overhead, but mm -hmm. you, you want to think about how long does this operation take to actually occur and then throttle relative to that. So, and here's the fire async, I'll control F12 and here we can see the fire async is going to take in a work item. So some kind of asynchronous function to execute. The very first thing that's done here is a lock using uh, this just object that's read only. And that way I can push onto the work item stack in a concurrent safe manner, that work item that I was just given. And if my work items stack has more than one work item on it. I don't have to await this fire async anymore because there was a prior event that is awaiting the fire async already. And because we throw away all of the events that happened, except for the most recent one, only uh, one of those events has to sit there await awaiting it. Uh, and then I just go on to await the delay. I do the lock again. So this lock is to push something on. And then I have a lock to pop something off. I then clear. And I have two tasks that runs that I'm doing here. One of them being to await the work item itself. And then one of them to be awaiting the delay. Uh, I've seen people use a timer. Uh, I think literally the class name is timer for mm -hmm. this throttle delay. Uh, I perhaps should be using it. I'm not sure. Uh, I got to look into that. So additionally, uh, I just brought up the fact that I'm doing a task that run here. Uh, one of the big optimizations was when I'll bring up the application again. I'm on line six currently in this text editor, and I'm going to hold down the J key and just uh, pay attention to whether or not there's any lag as I'm holding down the J key, uh, stuttering. Uh, so I'm holding it down right now, and uh, it looks quite smooth. Uh, mm -hmm. And perhaps this isn't something that you even think about uh, unless you've written a text editor, uh, because it seems to just work uh, in all the other ones. But in a single threaded environment, holding down the J key like this would uh, end up blocking the UI in, until I had let go. And you wouldn't see anything right to the screen until after I let go. Uh, so in a WASM application, for example, you'll see that happen. One of the ways to fix it could be doing a task.yield. Uh, I'll just type that task.yield you would await this, and then that, that's the UI update. But typically, what I had done is I was using a background service uh, interface that I added. So 
over in the text editor library, I have my hosted service case. And instead of using task.run, when it comes to typing, I wanted to have the runtime manage that background task. Because when you do task.run, it's nobody knows that it is happening. Uh, nobody knows that it exists. It might run, it might not. It's just kind of uh, in the air. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you make yourself a background task interface that implements the Microsoft.extensions.hosting background service, well, let me go over to my server-side host in program.cs. You can see uh, there's add singleton, add transient, add scoped. Uh, and here we have add hosted service. So this hosted service will get started uh, when you start running your application. And it will gracefully, it will be given an opportunity to gracefully shut down when the application is closed. Uh, I do believe there's also, there's the graceful shutdown and then it uh, goes into a forceful shutdown, I believe, under certain circumstances. Um, as you see, oh, the app shutting down. Let me let me clean up and finish what I'm doing here uh, as opposed to a task.run. Hmm. Another thing that you'll see about this is, what was that? Oh, I was just gonna uh, say, we, we do have some questions. Um, yeah. when, when you're at a good point to take them, um, uh, Okay, uh, I guess I would just say one more thing. Um, another uh, way to do the background task would be to use hang fire. And then hang fire, the difference is it's going to store uh, your background tasks in a database so that you can run them again. But I'm, I'm good for the questions. Awesome, yeah, this, this looks fantastic. Um, yeah, so we do have a question about state management. So you you mm -hmm. mentioned um, earlier that you used dependency injection to separate the state management from the UI aspect of, of the editor. Um, but we do have a question also, do you use Fluxer? For... I do use Fluxer, yes. Okay. Uh, Fluxer is just a uh, state management library. And I'll show you what the code for that looks like. So that would be in the lucidsys.common. Uh, Every one of my C Sharp projects, I believe, uses Fluxer. And so you'll find inside of them a folder that is named store. And this is where I uh, isolate all of my application state that I can inject from anywhere in the application. And that's an incredibly uh, useful thing. So I believe the dry case is here. Uh, I believe the drag case is one of the less interesting ones because there's not much going on other than firing the event. Uh, but I'll show you it. So there's various ways that you can set up your classes as usual. But I like to break it down into, well, I've got a drag state. Uh, and I want to have all of the modifications that I can do in one file. And I want to have the handling of those modifications in another file. So I'll say that again real quick. Uh, drag state.main, well, that contains the state itself. And it's a partial class. Well, how do I change drag state? You would do that by dispatching in action. So I have a separate file and then partial class on this drag state. I list out all of my actions in here. And then uh, additionally, I have a file for the drag states reducer. And the reducer is a child class of the drag state and it is private. So one of the useful things with Fluxer is the immutability that is involved in it. So in main, I have a constructor, uh, this should be private, uh, in my opinion, at least. Uh, I don't know why I didn't make it private. But you could see, because this is private, it is literally impossible uh, I, well, but, yeah, uh, to make an instance of this because mm -hmm. it's private. Uh, 
uh, I guess reflection would kind of do stuff. But anyhow, um, this is private. It's super uh, safe. Like if you see drag state, you know where it's coming from. You know the origin of it. And you can track all of the state changes super easily because it's just coming from this one uh, source, this singular source of truth, as they say uh, in Fluxer that the store is the singular source of truth for all of your state. And so for that reasoning, I go on to further, I make my reducer a child class on my states and then I mark them as private. Uh, so again, let me go to main. This is my state, it has a private parameterless constructor. Nobody's going to create an instance of this. My reducer is the one that actually handles the modifications. Well, it's a private child class on the state. Again, nobody can change anything. So how might uh, someone get around this? Because if you can't change anything, it's not very useful. And the entry point to change something comes from this reducer method attribute. And we see here it's taking in a set drag state action. And here we can see it's listed in my drag state.actions.cs file. So the only way to modify drag state.main is to through the uh, I dispatcher of Fluxer, you do dispatcher.dispatch, and I'll show you an actual line of this code. Uh, and then you would pass into it the action you want to dispatch. Let me go ahead and uh, get an actual use case usage of the I dispatcher. Uh, control shift F. Okay, so here's the dialogue service. Uh, you may have seen I kept opening dialogues. I kept converting notifications to dialogues. Well, how is all that done? Uh, I use Fluxer for everything. So I have my dialogue service, which has uh, dependency injected into it, the dispatcher, and Fluxer is going to be the one that had set up this I dispatcher service. Uh, so I think grab that as a field. And I then have these very simple uh, AI, these simple API uh, for very clear operations that you can do. So register dialogue record. Uh, that's going to display a dialogue. I can pass into here my dialogue record that I want to display. It then uses the Fluxer dispatcher to dispatch a register action. Uh, and then it passes in even furthermore that dialogue record from the invocation. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I'm like, is sharing your screen, okay. <laughs> um, so, If I F12 to the dialogue record, this one's a bit, uh, that's a dialogue record. Uh, specifically, I had meant uh, the dialogue records collection. And then we can, we can go to the dialogue record from there. So again, I had this three uh, partial class set up so that I isolate my state, my actions, and my reducer. Again, this is public. I don't know why it's public. I usually make them private, I swear. But anyway, um, in here, I have my immutable list of dialogue records. And we just saw the API for this one, th this method here, to register a dialogue record. So you register a dialogue record. The Fluxer dispatcher then goes on to dispatch the register action 
and that register action will contain your dialogue record that you want to render. Uh, I can go on to look at the dialogue records collection. Well, it's an immutable list of dialogue record. So that's going to result in you having your immutability involved. Uh, and go to the actions. Here's the register action that was being dispatched in the reducer. There's then a uh, reducer method attribute in which this reduce register action, it takes in the current dialogue records collection and then it outputs the next dialogue records collection. And for that reasoning, what I can do in this method is say, let me add into my dialogue records a uh, another dialogue record, which is to say the one that is on this register action. I add that guy in there. The reason uh, you capture this reference is because it's an immutable list. Uh, and then you update the dialogue records collection uh, to point at your new immutable list uh, that has the extra dialogue in there. So what's the blazer look like? Uh, so in common, uh, I have a folder for dialogue. And in here, I have my dialogue initializer. So the dialogue initializer, there's hardly any code here. Uh, and all it's doing is grabbing, uh, I'll show you the code behind in a second. Uh, it grabs that immutable list of the dialogue records, which I just shown you how to uh, change the value of. It does a for each loop and passes to the dialogue display blazer component uh, via the blazer parameter dialogue record, that dialogue record that I'm iterating, that iteration variable here. Uh, additionally, the at key is used because when you uh, insert or remove, you kind of jumble around the ordering of things and you want to correlate the state uh, to ex existing UI when you do a state is changed. So I'm saying dialog record dot dialog key. So this says uh, anytime that I render, check to see if there's uh, already something being rendered uh, that's marked with this key. And really quickly, uh, I use the word key a lot. So I'll say like data type key. Uh, it's just a wrapper for, for a GUID so that you have very uh, obvious API. Instead of accepting a GUID, I accept a dialog key. Well, it's a record. So if I write a dialog key equals equals dialog key, uh, like food dialog key, bar dialog key, and leave like that. Uh, because it's a record, it's going to compare this inner GUID. So it ends up looking very nice throughout your code because you're just comparing these keys as you normally would with comparing GUIDs, but the data type in the compiler is going to give you that type safety and let you know uh, whether or not you're passing in the right thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's nice. There's a feature I've been watching in C Sharp 12 called extensions that I think is going to make that a little bit easier, that pattern for like creating a typed ID. Oh, yeah? Cause, yeah, because that, that's been a, lo a long term thing people have been struggling with of like, if you use an int or a string or whatever, it's very easy to pass them in the wrong order. You don't have that type safety, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this, that's really cool. It's a nice pattern. Yeah. Uh, 
And then just one further comment about this pattern. Uh, I highly recommend uh, including an empty construct. So I don't know why I don't have one for the dialogue key, but if I go to, uh, I know for a fact that, that the text editor view model has this. So it's empty constructs here. Uh, it's just a static read-only instance. I'm invoking, I'm invoking the constructor, but I'm giving it grid.empty. Well, this removes the need to do null checks because you just use the empty uh, key as your pseudo null value, kind of. Uh, and that, that really helps a lot uh, with getting rid of nulls. So, yeah, that's, that? that's one nice thing about doing things that way is that, um, is that you can also extend, um, for like, like you're effectively extending GUID to have like an empty property. So you can, you know, if you want to augment things, you can do it however you want. Um, yeah. also I think C sharp has support, uh, has support for, uh, record structs now too. Um, yeah, that's true. which, which would, uh, also like reduce allocations maybe. Um, oh yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. but then the next thing to go on from here mm -hmm. is we're talking about the dialogue. So we might as well talk about this drag and drop thing. How, how does this work? Um, you can see, I can move a H if you say I can move a blazer component and then at all of the edges, there are these handles. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor change, but I have the vertical, uh, north and south one and the east-west and so on. There's also the diagonal ones. And you can full screen your component and then unfull screen it and you see it remembered the exact position. So how am I doing that? Uh, let me go perhaps right click and then inspect uh, just to show you really quickly uh, something that's very helpful. Like I feel like if you just, so here it is. Uh, it's this width, and then I'm setting it to a calc. Uh, so this doesn't look too pretty. Uh, let me actually show you the code. Uh, this calc CSS value is something that I uh, create uh, by combining together a string. Uh, so it's not something that I'm uh, manually doing, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've been wondering about the the whole like layout. To, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very yeah. curious about that. Uh, all of the logic uh, for sort of drag and drop and such. Uh, mm -hmm. That is to say, the the C sharp logic is found in this dimensions folder. So, let's see where I am. I'm in luthitus.common.razorlib. Here's my dimensions folder. Uh, ignoring Blazor for a second, uh, all the C sharp logic is found here. And then you go on to add the Blazor component in a second. But it starts off with a element dimensions uh, instance. And let's see. You can see here that I'm kind of adding uh, into a list of dimension attributes various uh, instances of this dimension attribute class. And I'm marking it with an enum. So if I F12 here, it's dimension attribute kind. Let me F, uh, go back. So I'm saying, uh, I have this element dimensions. I want to track the width. I want to track the height and so on and so on, the mm -hmm. top and the bottom. Uh, in addition to that tracking of all of those dimension attributes, you would then have the element position kind. The default would be static. And you could also pick absolute or you could pick fixed. Uh, so is it fixed? relative to the document, I believe, uh, entirely or absolute 
the closest relative positioned element. Um, and to get the style string, I was saying how I uh, interpolate this style string whenever I need it. Uh, otherwise, you would kind of go insane. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way this is done is just by using string builders. So I have my string builder. I append to it the CSS position. And then for each of the dimension attributes, I want to append to it that dimension attributes style string, which we then end up going deeper and seeing here how the dimension attributes are working. Dimension attribute contains a list of dimension units. So what is a dimension unit? Well, it has a double for its value and it has a dimension unit kind. So is that pixels, viewport width, viewport height, percentage, and it has a dimension operator kind. Is it an add, subtract, multiply, divide? Because you want to combine these dimension units in order to say, I want 80 view width minus uh, 50 px. And you keep uh, more or less your view width value constant. Uh, it can change, but you don't tend to change it. So for example, my dialogues always have a view width of, uh, always have a width attribute that has a value associated with it of 60 view width. Uh, and then to make it larger or, or smaller, you just do 60 view width minus the diff of the user's cursor when they started moving versus when they stopped. Uh, it's just 60 view width minus the pixel movement of their cursor is how mm. that's working there. Uh, so just a quick time check. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, um, but we don't have a lot of time left uh, today. Could we, do you mind if we go over some other like high level questions? Uh, that's fine. Is, okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so one of the questions is about, um, so in addition to building the actual editor, you, you, also, you also mentioned you're creating a, uh, a parser from scratch as well. So there's some, um, there's some questions about like, you know, could you use an LSP instead of doing, the, doing that from scratch? Like why, um, what was your uh, idea behind doing it all yourself basically? Uh, I didn't want to use an LSP because there's a lot of functionality that you gain from using an LSP. But at the same time, it is limiting to some degree, I feel. And so I wanted to do it myself so that I had full uh, freedom to do whatever I want with it and not have to adhere to the protocol, uh, the language server protocol. And Roslyn uh, is great as well, but it felt uh, just like there were opinionated things that I didn't really uh, want to go with. So I just went my own way is all, but they're great. Uh, both of those. I'm sure it's also an amazing, like learning experience to do it all yourself. Um, oh yeah. yeah. And then we have another question. Um, the question is, uh, about the broader scope of the project. Um, so how, how easy or difficult is it to implement support for new languages? So that comes down to writing. I can actually show you that, show you real quick. Uh, so here I have my uh, luthitis.ide.classlib C sharp project. Inside of there is compiler services. I have some common logic, such as the uh, lexers, the uh, are going to use syntax tokens. So all of my syntax tokens are common logic. Uh, all of my syntax nodes, uh, for example, you have a literal expression node. Uh, well, I try and share all the code that I can. So I'm sharing my syntax tokens, my syntax nodes, 
and my symbols, the binder, uh, some of that's shared, and then the evaluator. But what I'm trying to get at here is I have this other folder, not just common, but one called languages. And in here, I have three separate uh, languages in here. So I'm trying my best to make it so that you could easily add in JavaScript and you would just make your JavaScript folder and then you would implement your lexer, your parser, your binder. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. I'm cool. curious and, about uh, that too, like how, how you have, so the language parsing as you're typing and stuff, things as you to every letter you press makes the code valid or invalid or whatever. Do you do some special things to manage to make it performant or to, yeah. you know what I mean? You're loading up the entire application. Um, curious about like how you manage the, you know, that. When it comes to typing, mm -hmm. uh, I want to do more than I currently am, but currently I have it so that if you type white space, it will parse the file that you're in. And if you type semicolon, it'll parse the file you're in. If huh. you do a few of the control, uh, key maps will also trigger a parse. So if you save your file, it will trigger a parse. But I should also go even further beyond that and then say, well, you modified such and such part of the uh, syntax tree. So if I know where these text bands are, I can sort of figure this, this stuff out and do it more optimally, uh, which is what Roslyn does, I believe. I believe they do it uh, optimally by looking at the syntax tree. I haven't gotten there yet. Still very, very impressive. Um, wow. Yeah, so um, I guess as we're nearing the end, I, I kind of pre-prepared some like rapid fire questions about, yeah. um, you know, that might kind of help help the like broader Blazor community learn from your expertise. So, um, so one question I have is like, what aspects of Blazor have been most useful um, when creating this project? Um, I really like the fact that when I'm using Blazor, I don't have to make a Ajax request and uh, do that. Uh, and additionally, just getting rid of as much JavaScript as I can uh, is a huge part of it. Like that dialogue that you, that you saw, uh, if you wanted to do this in MVC, I would imagine you have to use client-side JavaScript Whereas I get to do all of this in C sharp and I love it. Uh, it's great uh, for that reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Having being able to build interactive websites in C sharp is 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 definitely amazing for a .NET developer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so on the opposite side of that, what aspects have been uh, really tricky or challenging um, that others might want to be aware of uh, when it comes to doing an advanced application like this using Blazor? Uh, the most tricky thing for me, uh, like right now during this demo, I got super lucky that nothing froze because <laughs> what happens is, um, Fotino is single threaded and what I'll do is I'll await and end up, uh, blocking myself. Uh, it's sort of that configure, uh, that, uh. Await foo dot dot configure await is dot configure await is that it yeah yeah uh, and then mm -hmm. false uh, that helps mm -hmm. because you don't have to come back to, I don't know the exact wording uh, come back to the Blazor synchronization yes yeah 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 um, the other one would be a task dot run uh, more preferably than task dot run would be your background service. Uh, doing something with that. Those those three things help. The configure await false background services, task.run, those are huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, OK, cool. So I guess uh, if, if you, like what tips would you have for someone who is trying to create a project as ambitious as this one, um, other than what you've already shared? <laughs> Yeah, um, I find it really useful to, what you want 
like best case scenario, you can make a plan and then follow through with it. But when it came to the text editor, I had no idea what to do. And I figured the best idea would be to make those mistakes because I'm in an environment where it wouldn't cause any uh, damage to anyone. Uh, I can make those mistakes freely and learn from them. So you just sort of go for it. You say, I'm going to put a on key down event handler on the entirety of a website even, and then yeah. just see if I hit J, can I get that into the console? Uh, can I append that to a string builder? Uh, and then just kind of break down this large problem as much as you can into the smaller problems. Mm -hmm. And then I think of like, re like recursion, you're going to bubble back up and then have the sum be the solution to the larger problem is what I would say. Hmm. Yeah. It's, I think that's such great advice. Cause I think a lot of people when facing a huge challenge like this fall into analysis paralysis where they just spend too much time thinking about it and worrying about all the complexity, but at some point, yeah, I just got to make something and it might be bad at first, but you can iterate even to find and eventually you get something amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, last question from me. Um, if you had to pick one aspect of Blazor Studio that you're most proud of, uh, what would it be? I would say the text editor because uh, we were just talking about that analysis paralysis and then making something even if it's uh, not exactly perfect. Uh, I've been working on this specific text editor for eight months now. Uh, Blazor Studio mm -hmm. as a whole has been one year at this point, but I have an entire year's worth prior to the last year. So in other words, two years ago is when I started working on this. I spent an entire year getting nowhere. <laughs> and then this last year, everything is kind of starting to click. I uh, And I'm very proud of the fact that I stuck through and did that. Yeah, so that's cool. That's Yeah, some, so many things about any programming task is learning what doesn't work, right? And then you set, settle on, you know, winning pattern, but a lot of it is like making the mistakes and crossing yeah. them off the list. So there, there have been like you showed off amazing stuff with Fluxer and there's a question here. Would this have been possible without Fluxer? I mean, I would say it would have been, it would be possible without Fluxer. It's just that I would end up personally writing Fluxer myself <laughs> uh, yeah. because it's all about just uh, it like Blazor Studio. I mean, specifically, it's just about uh, dependency injection, immutability, uh, some concurrency is involved. So mm -hmm. I would just end up writing that uh, is all it would be. I would say when, if, if we're, you know, moving towards wrapping up one other thing is just, can you um, take us to, um, you know, you want to show off like website or show us, you know, how people can get, get more involved in this. Yeah. Uh, so I'll bring up my GitHub. Uh, this one, here we go. And my GitHub is, well, let me zoom in. My GitHub you can see here is Luthitus. And on my profile, I have a few things here. The first thing is a link to a demo. So I'll open that up real quick. I just control clicked it, open it up over here. And uh, this does not run on mobile right now, by the way. It, it literally crashes immediately. Uh, that being said, though, if you're on a desktop, uh, you can get this open here. And it's got this drag and drop related things that I was just showing you in the Botino application. Uh, in addition to that, very interesting to me is the semantic uh, explorer. So for example, I can go, remember I was trying to go to definition? I'll show you it right now. Hopefully it works uh, because I have the I person model right here. Well, it sees the identifier token. It sees this is a bug. It shouldn't say compilation unit, uh, but I can then see the person model. I double click on the identifier token and you'll see the file will open. It opens right now. Uh, and then I'll click on the uh, interface. I hit F12 right now and there we go. It worked. Uh, so. That's really cool. Uh, but this is my GitHub. Uh, previously, I was Hunter C. Freeman. Uh, I moved my things so that it didn't have the Blazor namespace in it. 
and that's that yeah awesome cool. and you have a youtube channel as well right um uh yeah i do um let's see i have, I have I a go. link to it if 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 it's okay if i share it um yeah yeah that, <laughs> and that's fine okay yeah I've, I've seen some of your videos and they're uh it's super fun to watch you like work on this editor um, uh, it's All right. Cool. Yep. Um, awesome. Cool. So I think I think we're about ready to wrap it up. Um, so thank you again, Hunter, for coming on. This was such such a cool project. Um, this is, I think, the most advanced Blazor project I've I've ever seen personally. So um, I I really hope to keep going with it, and it's 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 amazing, and I'm see I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. Oh, cool. Thank you guys for bringing me on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for showing it off. Very inspiring. And, and uh, you know, thanks for sharing the patterns and things that have worked for you too. Yeah. Yeah, Very for cool. sure. Awesome. All right. Well, let's wrap up there. Thanks a bunch. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.